Richard, the so-called extended evolutionary synthesis is controversial, and it calls out certain things that were not part of the modern synthesis or neo-Darwinism, one of which is niche construction. Uh, you have uh, made an important contribution in what's called the extended phenotype, which may encompass something like niche construction. Uh, what is the extended phenotype? How did it come about? And what work can it do? First, I don't think niche construction is a very coherent idea. Um, <laughs> extended phenotype is. Um, Phenotype is the external, well, well simply the man manifestation of, of genes. So, so that which, right. I mean, I would think of it as the, the levers by which genes lever themselves into the, in the tools by which in, uh, genes lever themselves into the next generation. Um, so um, I usually like to build up to the extended phenotype going via animal artifacts, things like birds' nests mm -hmm. or uh, the houses of caddis larvae, little insects, little live in water and build houses out of stone, beautifully made little stone houses, um, or beaver dams. Yeah, but that's the classic one that's used. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, a bird's nest or a caddis house or a beaver dam are all clearly Darwinian adaptations. They are all um, devices used by animals to survive and uh, propagate their genes. Because they're Darwinian adaptations, they must, like every other Darwinian adaptation, be the product of genes which are selected. So there must be genes for nests of a particular shape. You've got a weaver bird's <laughs> nest, you have some wonderful shapes, long tubes to keep snakes out and things. Um, <laughs> these must have evolved, and you could, if, if one could get an evolutionary history, it'd be very nice, you could get a very simple nest becoming more and more elaborate. Um, the evolution of an animal artifact, like a nest, has got to have come about through the natural selection of genes. Therefore, there must be genes for a phenotype, which is not a part of the animal, which is made of grass or stone or, <laughs> or, or mud or wood. Um, so that's step one of sort of softening up of understanding the extended phenotype artifacts. Then, um, Think about parasites that live inside their host. And in many cases, parasites have rather complicated life histories where they have an intermediate host and then a definitive host. And the intermediate host might be a snail or an ant or something. And the definitive host might be a cow or, or a sheep or a bird. And the as far as the parasite's concerned, it's got to get from the intermediate host, like the ant or the worm, or the, or the, or the snail, into the definitive host, probably by being eaten. So um, a fluke that is in an ant needs to, be, needs to have its ant eaten by a sheep in order to get into the next stage in, in its life history. And there are lots and lots of rather macabre examples of parasites manipulating their intermediate host to make them more likely to get eaten mm. or, or in one other way to get passed on to the definitive mm. host. A nice example is the so-called brain worm, which is a fluke which causes an ant, gets into the ant as the intermediate host, it burrows into the brain of the ant, manipulates the brain, makes a lesion in the brain of the ant, which causes the ant to behave in an abnormal way and to climb up to the top of grass stems, mm. where it's, which is not a thing an ant will normally do, um, and thereby gets more likely to be eaten. So it's like a little puppet master, a little marionette master <laughs> inside the brain of the ant, mm. causing the ant to, um, to do what's necessary. And there are lots and lots of examples like that, and some of them are, are pretty bizarre. Well. Parasites don't have to live inside their hosts. We call cuckoos parasites. We call cuckoo nestlings parasites. They, they um, hatch out in the nest of a, of a host, which might be a reed warbler or, or a hedge sparrow. And um, they toss out the eggs, the rival eggs of the, of the own species. They then are in, left in sole possession of the nest. And the host foster parent doesn't know it's a cuckoo and feeds it. Sometimes goes up to 
a rather grotesque length where the baby cuckoo is huge, dwarfs the foster parent, and yet the foster parent goes on shoveling food into it, and it's a really rem remarkable thing. This is manipulation, and just like the brain worm manipulates the ant by making a lesion in its brain, the baby cuckoo doesn't make a lesion in the brain of the foster parent, but it does something equivalent, we're not quite sure what, but something about the way the cuckoo is causes the foster parent to feed it, even when it's <laughs> clearly not its own child to our eyes. Um, so it's an analogy to the, to the brain worm. It's, it's, it's making use of action at a distance, a rather short distance in this case, because it's just a, a few inches away. But it is manipulation using perhaps its gape, its bright red, red gape that, that is, a, is a super normal stimulus for the, for the foster parent. Well, that's just a few inches. And then... Um, but it doesn't matter if it's a few inches or, or, or a dam uh, 100 meters away, it's outside the body. That's, it's outside the, 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 the body, that's right. Well, now I, I would move on to other kinds of animal communication. When a, when a male bird sings, this has been shown in doves and in canaries to cause the gonads, the ovaries of the female that hears the song, or witnesses the courtship behavior, the ovaries swell. So the male is manipulating the female. Now, a male might wish that he could make a lesion in the female's brain or inject her with hormones or inject or stimulate her brain with electrodes like a physiologist might. He can't do that. But he does the next best thing, which is to sing. And this has the same effect. This is action at a distance. Mm. So whereas I would say that um, the behavior of the uh, ant is extended phenotype of the, the brain worm's genes, and then the um, foster parent, the reed warbler foster parent, the change in behavior of that is extended phenotype of the cuckoo's genes because the cuckoo's adaptation has to come about by the natural selection of cuckoo genes. Mm. And then finally, the uh, canary or the dove or presumably any other bird where males manipulate females by singing to them. Once again, this is natural selection working on the genes of the male to have ext extended phenotypic effect on the behavior, the gonads, the hormonal state of the female. So that's action at a distance, at a, at a greater distance. Um, the ext it's extended phenotype all the way along. Um, the hallmark of the extended phenotype is that it has to be a Darwinian adaptation. You have to be able to say the change in the um, behavior of the canary, say, or the, or the reed warbler is produced by a change in the genes of the manipulator. That's the hallmark of the extended phenotype. So that a, a, a beaver's dam is, you see it, uh, and the argument is, is that when the, the, um, the niche or the externality is the other side argument, uh, is that when that's created, then that has a, an effect, a recursive effect on the, on the the natural selection uh, or the evolution of the uh, of the of the uh, beaver in this case or anything else. So it it becomes a, a circular process. Yes, I, I want to be careful here. I mean, the beaver dam is a nice example. Again, it's it's action at a considerable distance yes. because the the beaver dam is producing a great lake and the and the lake is valuable to the to the beaver. It's a true extended phenotype because natural selection of beaver genes has perfected via the building behavior and via a whole lot of other stages in the, in the embryology of the, of the beaver. Natural selection has perfected the dam and hence the lake um, through, through the individual genetic advantage to the beaver. Now, when you talk about um, niche construction and um, this circular recursive process, 
that's benefiting lots of other creatures. That's not an extended phenotype. That, I mean, to the extent that other creatures may benefit from the beaver dam, well, good luck to them, but that's not why the beaver sure, does it. Sure. Um, the beaver does it purely because the beaver's genes are benefited by the lake. Sure. So what you're saying, in essence, that you can reduce, like you, re you can reduce a, a fraction from uh, the, the niche construction of the beaver dam to the gene. So niche construction as a concept does not add anything to the traditional modern system. No, it, it, if, if, if it's true that, that something about an animal's behavior changes the habitat, changes the environment that other animals can benefit from, and, and in enthusiasts for niche construction talk about um, tussocks and copies and mm -hmm. things like that. That may well happen. That's incidental. Mm -hmm. That's not a Darwinian adaptation. That's just, just something that happens. Right, as a, as a, as a corollary, uh, it yes. may happen or may not happen. Yes. But the, but the, the, the construction of the beaver dam, so-called niche construction, is can be explained totally by the, 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 the selection at the gene level. In, in, the, in the case of the beaver dam, yes, that, that, that's right. And, and, and my point is that if there are other creatures, if there are fish that benefit from, from the lake, that's fine, them. but it's nothing to do with the beaver. Just... <laughs>